Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This episode of Real Put Forward is made possible by the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning your next trip to Tennessee. Today's guest is Dr. Keith Carver, the 11th Chancellor at the University of Tennessee at Martin. We have tried to make this happen uh, for a while, but our schedule have not, and now it took a it took a, a pandemic for us to be able to get together. Scott, I, I've been I've been following you now for about two years, and to be honest, I've I've been ducking this. I mean, I've been waiting so I could sort of get my hip factor up enough to where I thought I was a worthy guest. So, oh, uh, r- really, listen, big fan of of what you all are doing in Discovery Park and in the, our region and beyond, and and just thrilled to be on the show today. Well, of course, we uh, a lot of what we do uh, is uh, sort of done because of all the people that are coming out of UT Martin and a great partnership between our two organizations. So um, I, I want to start from the very beginning. So tell me a little bit about where you were born and what your parents did and, and your family life as a child. Absolutely. You know, uh, from this from this area, very much like you have, have roots here. Uh, was born in um, Jackson, Tennessee, but raised in Crockett County. Um, my father was a high school football coach and coached girls basketball. Uh, but he and my mother um, split when when I was about seven, and and Dad moved over to Middle Tennessee, where his parents were from, and. Um, I was raised at that point by my mother and grandmother, um, who uh, my grandparents owned a country store in Frog Jump, Tennessee. And so um, it served as kind of the the, the grocery, the feed store uh, in a very agrarian, small agrarian community right on the edge of Lauderdale and Crockett County, Highway 88, um, just east of Murray City, Tennessee, west of Murray City, Tennessee. And um, my, my grandparents lived in a real small house next door, but my mother and I actually lived in the store. Uh, right behind the meat department, there was a little efficiency. It was, was one bedroom, um, a little uh, den area, and a bathroom, and a kitchen, uh, all about uh, 800 square feet. And, um, you know, my, my mother wanted me to feel uh, pretty special, so I did not realize until I was about to get be married Um, And we were talking about that, that actually I had the bedroom and my mother slept on the couch in the, in the den. She wanted me to feel like uh, I had a place to put my stuff. And, um, but you know, uh, I I sort of humble beginnings, but you know, I I felt loved by my dad who was in Middle Tennessee, felt very loved by my mom and and my grandmother and grandfather and uh, really loved growing up in that, that small community. Went on and graduated uh, from high school at, at Crockett County High School. Um, needed uh, needed some financial assistance for college, and and uh, like so many students in uh, Northwest Tennessee, had uh, went to the school that offered me the most scholarship and financial aid, which was Memphis State University, and went to Memphis State and was fortunate to get most of my education paid for. Uh, it was at Memphis State I met this uh, beautiful co-ed named uh, Holly Ann Holmes, and was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. And uh, she grew up in Lexington, Tennessee, come to find out her brother and I knew each other from high school. And I was so happy that I had that entry point with her, with her brother, um, and started dating Holly Ann. We, we got pretty serious. Uh, uh, fast forward, uh, left Memphis to go to Knoxville uh, to, to go to graduate school uh, and pretty much have been at the University of Tennessee for almost three decades since then. So um, uh, have, have really loved uh, this opportunity, came back to West Tennessee um, a little over three years ago, and I've just started my fourth year as chancellor here at UT Martin, and just am so blessed that um, I'm near family and near Holly Ann's family. Uh, but also, I think the students we serve, Scott, I, I feel a real kinship because um, so many of the first generation or Pell eligible students that are coming, I really feel like I relate uh, to those students really well and those communities. And uh, it's just a real honor to be back. So um, clearly education has been a big part of your life. Did your did that start with your mom and your grandparents or your dad? I mean, who who pushed you towards education? You know, I, I think um, I would have to say my mother, you know, uh, <clears throat> after the divorce, she worked for the Department of Human Services. 
and she um, at night decided she she wanted to try to get her degree and so she started taking um, two classes a semester at Jackson State well that was before distance education online platforms so I remember as an elementary school kid we we pile up in her uh, green two-door Ford Fairmont and we'd drive to Jackson two nights a week and, and she would be in math or civics or English and I would sit in the back and do my homework uh, but but I think watching mom uh, do that and try to get her degree and, and try to get a, a baccalaureate uh, associates in a baccalaureate really sort of inspired me to you know I, I, I need I need to do this too uh, and I think from from those days on, watching her as an adult, a single mom go through this, I, I think it told me, you know, I, I need to do that. But um, you know, I um, I uh, coming out of Crockett County, uh, I almost uh, dropped out of college. I had a uh, really was not prepared for school. Um, and I'm telling you this now as chancellor of a, a big public school, but. But I went to Memphis, did not have good study habits, uh, was not prepared, and I had a 1.98 uh, my Christmas of my freshman year. I uh, had made up my mind. I was embarrassed. Uh, I was on probation to lose my scholarship, and it just sort of made up my mind that I wasn't going to go back to school. I was going to find a job and work and maybe go to community college, maybe. Uh, maybe I would just work. Maybe I just wouldn't cut out for college. But it was my mother and my grandmother at that point that intervened and said, no, you're not, you're not going to quit. You know, you're going to, and, and I was thankful because I went back, made just enough of a GPA adjustment to keep my scholarship and then ended up uh, graduating with honors. So I, I, I really think it was my mother and grandmother that really inspired me, but then pushed me. So when you were that little kid sitting in the back of the classroom, you probably weren't aspiring to grow up one day and be a college president. Um, what what uh, what were you thinking you wanted to be when you grew up? You know, I I, I really uh, at that time just thought I wanted to be a be a doctor, and uh, I had an uncle that was on my dad's side that was a pharmacist. He lived down in Houston, Texas, uh, and and uh, I remember uh, the one thing I remember about him. He died unfortunately very early, but the one thing I remember is uh, he had a red Firebird. And I thought, you know, if I go to medical or pharmacy school, I can have a red sports car just like my Uncle John. Now, this is seven-year-old Keith, right? You know, um, but I do. I, I remember, and that was the first sort of really uh, successful person that I ever met was, was my Uncle John in, in, down in Houston. And uh, he had this flashy red sports car. And, and, you know, so I thought, man, I need to. I need to, I need to be a pharmacist or a doctor. And for a long time, you know, I wanted to be um, in those medical fields, but, but certainly knew as I got older that science wasn't my thing and uh, people was what I really wanted to do and uh, be around people. So it, it changed, it changed quickly. What, what was your major? You know, I, um, I started out in, was taking uh, some, some natural sciences and some and business courses, uh, just kind of figuring it out. But one summer, I took a class uh, called Sociology of the South and uh, was absolutely blown away and it studied Southern culture and it was sort of post-Civil War Southern culture. And, and, it was, and it was the first class I took, Scott, where I felt like, man, I, I, I enjoy this. I'm reading more than a that has been assigned. I was picking the, the professor's brain. I would come hang around in his office. And uh, so he said, well, hey, I'm offering a, 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 another course. Um, second term, why don't you take it? And I, I, so I took it. And um, at that point, I thought, you know, I think I really like sociology and the humanities. So my sophomore year switched over and uh, took just heavy doses of of sociology, which ended up being my major, and lots of history and uh, lots of political science. And um, what was your net? What what drove you from from Memphis State after that? What? How did you end up getting deeper and deeper into higher ed? You know, I think when um, when I when I almost flunked out of when I well when I when I had the one nine eight, 
and I came back, uh, the Dean of Students really took uh, a special interest in me. And, and um, at that time, uh, you had to go meet with your with scholarship office and get, you know, make sure, check in with them. Are you studying? That sort of thing. And, and uh, as luck would have it, I went in one day to meet with uh, the scholarship advisor. She was not there. She was sick. So I had to go meet with um, uh, the vice president for student life, student affairs. He was seeing the students that day. And um, he, was a, he was a guy originally from Oneida, Tennessee. His name was Don Carson. And um, he, I think he saw my situation, saw that I had really struggled, um, asked me a lot about my background. And uh, so from that day, he sort of grabbed me and said, you know what? He said, I'm going to, um, uh, I know you've got a job off campus. I was washing cars at Mr. Pride Car Wash uh, on, on Poplar Avenue. Um, he said, you're going to quit that job and you're going to come work, work in my office and I'm going to keep my eye on you for 10 hours a week. And then he required me an additional 10 hours of study hall in his office. Uh, and I was really bitter because I, I needed the money and needed, but I didn't want him to tell me that I was going to have to come check in and study in his conference room 10 hours. But I did. And I made my grades and I worked for him uh, the rest of the time. I was in school and I just saw the difference that one person can make in your life. And by chance we met, by chance he took a, an opportunity to hire me uh, as a student in his office. And um, he's just made a huge impact on my wife. And matter of fact, our, our first child name is Carson. We named her after him. But at that point I knew I wanted to go. Um, and my, my goal in life uh, was to be a dean of students somewhere. I wanted to be a dean of students and work with students the rest of my life. I never aspired to to do this. So, um, yeah, I want to be a dean of students. It's interesting. So you have kids relatively close to the same age my kids are. Your kids mm -hmm. are a little bit younger, I think. And, um, you know, you and I went to college around the same time. So it's really yeah. interesting to think about the role that higher ed played in our generation's lives um, in the South. Um, and then the way it is with our children, you know, is a lot different. My relationship with my kids in higher ed was a lot different than my parents and mine. You know, they absolutely they, they were happy for me to go to college, but they didn't. You know, they didn't get quite as involved um, as my wife and I did with our kids. That's right. It's uh, what what are the differences that as from for, as a parent I see them, but from from where you sit. What kind of differences do you see in the way we choose and relate with colleges as parents today? Sure. You know, Scott, when you and I were, were coming out of school, we probably looked at at three or four colleges max. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I did. I mean, I thought, OK, I'm going to Martin. I'm going to Memphis. I might go to Knoxville. But probably not. Um, and then I started mom and I started figuring out what could we afford, who was going to give us the most financial aid and that sort of thing. And so, um, and, and, and you, I don't know what your situation was, but you, you probably too had just sort of, okay, these are the schools I'm going to consider. Um, when I look at our students now, um, now a lot of students in, in, in rural West Tennessee still think regionally and still think, okay, there's Martin, there's Memphis, there's, there's, um, um, you know, Union, there's, there's Fried Hardeman, there's all these, these other schools. Um, but, but I think in general, they also think, well, you know, let me look at, let me see what Emory's is all about. And I, I think, so as I, I think this generation of students, uh, they're not really, I don't want to say afraid, but there's this expectation almost of, you know what, um, I may, I may leave here. I, I might go, to Georgia who um, they do their homework early and 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 they know as a sophomore in high school you know I want to study architecture and, and that's not here I'm gonna need to go to Arkansas and study that or you know what uh, comparative politics uh, you know this program they've got at University of Virginia is, is incredible and, and I, I don't want to speak for you but I would have never done that amount of research or even thought that even was a possibility for Keith Carver in, in the mid to late eighties. I, I, I thought, you know, regionally, maybe the other end of the state, but students today are so savvy about um, what programs are offered and colleges are so much better about marketing themselves. And, and, you know, from the time they're a freshman um, on, 
you know, they're getting invitations to the Duke engineering camp in eighth grade and, and, and all these advanced programs. And so the colleges themselves have gotten better about promoting themselves. And so it's just a whole new world out there. Yeah, for me, um, I uh, was living in Memphis alone. My parents were living in another state, and I had uh, pa- I'd, I didn't register right away the first, you know, my freshman year. And then halfway through the year, I knew I needed to go to college, and so yeah. I just walked into the I walked around the University of Memphis campus, Memphis State, looking for what seemed like the place I should go, and something said admissions, and so I thought, well, that must be it. So That's I it. walked in, walked in, and said, you know, hi, what do I need to do to go here? And so they got me filling out forms and um, I, they said, you need to take the SAT or the ACT. And I said, well, I haven't done that yet. So they got me <laughs> hooked up for that and boom, there it was. Um, and so that's where I went, but you're, you're right. You know, my kids, we went to uh, college fairs where you walk along and there are tables set up and my daughter really took notes and really she ended up you know we were up in Virginia living she ended up going to uh, Loyola New Orleans yeah I, I didn't have that uh, even thinking that was a possibility for me. no no right. absolutely not absolutely not do you think some do you think some of the um, high schools too um, I think you can't say this, but I think some of the high schools may overdo it just a little bit in all the AP courses. And, you know, I, I had one of my daughters um, was taking an AP course that she had no business being in, to be honest with you, but yeah. they so much pressure on her. And I had, you know, I talked to the teacher, I was, I was like, loosen up a little bit. My gosh, they're see, they're, they're in high school, they're in sophomores, juniors. They don't need to be so focused on AP calculus that they're stressed out. So Anyway, I think that is a little bit about, too, they get this fear that they're going to get left behind if they don't, you know, apply themselves. They do. And, and you know, there, there's an awful lot of, um, uh, I don't it, it's 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 almost this um, looking over the fence to see what the neighbors are doing. And, and you know, as the neighbor, um, as the neighbor applied to Vanderbilt, has and there's this, I think the the students put so much pressure on them about, boy, I've got to have the top um, application in my high school, in my region, uh, to be accepted into these these great places when, in fact, uh, what they really would be happy doing, uh, they might find less than 100 miles from their house. And so, um, you know, and and we're so blessed. I've really gotten to know um, a lot of, of, of high school guidance counselors in, in this 21 county area uh, that we call God's country. And when you look at, at, at West Tennessee and these, these networks of schools, uh, really some people that really care and get to know and nurture these students and, and will say, you know, let's look at all the opportunities you have and then let's look at what this costs. And, and, and I, yeah, I, I, I know you think, um, this ex public school is going to be fifteen thousand dollars a year, but let's you know let's look at financial aid packages and look at true college cost. And uh, I've been so impressed. Before becoming a chancellor, I did not work as much with with uh, guidance counselors, principals, but they really do a good job of trying to exp- trying to get their students into areas where they can be successful. And I, I'm I'm so thankful for that. Well, UT Martin is a great example. My wife and I were both talking the other day. Of course, we didn't know we were going to be moving back to West Tennessee, but if we had of, we absolutely would have encouraged um, our daughters to look at UT Martin because it's, I mean, I've met at this point hundreds of graduates, you know, who are doing incredible work. Um, There's so many great programs. My um, oldest daughter loves planting and gardening. And so I've, oh. I've been emailing her things from the agriculture program. Sure. At UT Martin, because she could get her master's degree um, there. I'd love to have her come live with me and uh, go, to, <laughs> go to UT Martin. But I don't, I don't think she'll do that. She's in Memphis now. So yeah, well, she, she, my, my daughter uh, will graduate uh, next May, a, a year from May. Um, God willing. And she, she's, she's on path. Uh, but she is, and she's at Knoxville, but she's going to get her master's uh, from UT Martin. So uh, she's already looked at the program and what it'll entail. And so, um, and she looked really hard at Martin her senior year. I took this job and she, she, uh, 
had already accepted her offer to Knoxville, but she, she came over and looked at UTM anyway. And I remember she was, we were talking at the end of her tour and she said, dad, she said, I, I love you. And, um, I, I really love West Tennessee and, and Martin seemed like a really great place, but she said, but it's a little small if, if your dad's the chancellor. And yeah. She yeah, said, yeah. you know, I might like to date. I might like to do something. And um, uh, I, I think I think I better stay in Knoxville. She she did. I think I think I do have a shot with my two boys, though. They 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 love it here. And of course, they know a lot about the university just from my job. And I, I think they both would be happy in accounting or, or whatever they they choose uh, in a smaller place. Now, another another aspect of universities that's evolving and now will probably evolve even quicker is being able to get your degree and take classes online. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, UT Martin has really been on the, um, on the forefront of digital learning. Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, I can, and I, I, I remember this well back in 1999, uh, which was, was also a great Prince album, by the way, and I'm sure you had that on vinyl as well. But, but you know, um, back in 1999, UT as a system was going to get heavy into online and that was the way we were going. And so they, uh, w the platform was purchased and it was, and it was given to Martin to kind of get going, get some courses online. What never really caught on as a system. And so um, Chattanooga, Memphis, uh, Knoxville never really bought, got into the online education. We kept adding classes. So we just sort of took over UT online. And so it's been here since, 1999 and um, and it's advanced now and and when you look at um, percentage wise in terms of the, the total number of classes offered and then when you look at a percent of those that are in an online or remote platform uh, we are probably offering as much or more as anybody in the system and so uh, we've continued to do that now um, you know fast forward uh, a few years and we started offering a completer degree online. If you've got 60 hours uh, and you're a working adult and you want to come back, we'll help you complete your degree in a couple of different concentrations. And so that, that has really grown for us. I think uh, the, the most interesting way that, that we're working with online education now is in our graduate program. We have, we have five graduate programs. We're about to, we're going to add five more over the next two years. Uh, but every, every, class is going to be online. So uh, with graduate education, we're going to move towards 100% um, of our offerings being online. So we'll continue to do it. But I think one of the things that COVID-19 has taught us is, uh, you know, we, we've always heard, hey, you know, wow, someday the traditional university is going to go away. Everything's going to be online. And I, I think this experience uh, has shown us that I think there will always be a need for a residential college. And, and while we may all offer more, line, more online and be more savvy about it, there's, there's something about living in a residence hall with somebody uh, that's not like you or, or, or going and joining a Greek letter organization or going with a group of communication students and, and competing in a competition in New York City. And there's those those after hours conversations. There's the, the meeting someone in, in the Chick-fil-A line that you've never met. and you, you end up being really good friends and study sessions in the library. There's this human interaction uh, that happens at these places. And, and so I think this has shown us how valuable that is. When you talk to students that are struggling, what do you miss? I miss campus. I miss the cafe. I miss Starbucks. I miss the library. I miss my buddies. Um, and uh, it, that's been really interesting. That's been, it, it's almost been a homesickness for campus. And, and so, um, and I think there's something to that. Um, so that interaction is really important. Um, Another aspect of UT Martin that's specific uh, that might not apply to other universities is that it's in a rural community. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I've noticed is that because uh, moving from, you know, an urban oh, yeah. into a rural community, I didn't know what to expect. But because we have UT Martin so close, there's constantly an influx of new people in the professors. And then and uh, it really adds a lot to the culture of the community. What, what do you think the differences are in your job because you're in a rural community versus if you were at a university in say Atlanta or New York or whatever? 
Sure. You know, um, before coming into this role, I was the, the chief of staff for the system president for, for, for many years. And so in that role, um, I got to watch 10 different chancellors come and go on all these campuses. And so when you look at the chancellors for, say, the UT Health Science Center in Memphis, uh, the chancellor of University of Chattanooga, UT Chattanooga, UT Knoxville, much larger, more of an urban area. Uh, and then you look at Martin, I think the, 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 there is a piece in those cities, in those jobs where you go, you do your 60 hours a week, you're on campus, you're interacting, uh, but yet you can go out to dinner downtown and, and sort of fade into this being a private citizen and, and going to a play, uh, someone might recognize you, they, they might not, but um, in, in the rural areas, uh, by, by just because of the position you hold or, or um, you know, this being uh, the, the major public school outside of, of Memphis, uh, University of Memphis, there's this expectation that, okay, because of your position, you sit on this board. You represent education on this economic development committee. You, you, so there's, you know, you, you're in meetings in Paris, you're in Jackson, you're in Dyersburg, and so there's this uh, educational piece, but then there's this advocacy economic development expectation. And so um, I don't work any harder than any of those other chancellors. Let me be clear about that. But I think there are more expectations uh, in the community, in the region, um, than, than in other places because you're sort of the public school uh, that represents this large rural southwest, northwest Tennessee. And there's an expectation that you're at these meetings and you're contributing and uh, bringing faculty and helping solve problems. And, um, you know, I like that. That's what we should be doing as a regional um, undergraduate uh, institution is we need to be a part of these communities. And so uh, I don't mind it, but I knew that was part of the job. So I think if someone came in cold, uh, I think they would be shocked at um, the chamber events, the economic development events, uh, legislative events, caucus, and things that you need to come and be present, I think they would be surprised. But uh, I enjoy that. Um, I, I'm, I think that's part of the job I really like. Um, and, and you do a great job at it. And uh, I'm curious, <laughs> I know you do, I'm curious about the impact um, that social media has had um, on that part of your job you, you know, just like when you run a museum, you know, you're, you're supposed to have a presence on social media. Um, and oftentimes in university world, uh, the person who's actually got the presence in social media is the person who's in charge of the chancellor's Twitter account or whatever. Um, you, I've heard that you are in charge of your own social media accounts. I, I am, and uh, if you follow me and see how sophomoric it truly is, uh, you'll know no one could be that 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 uh, spontaneous. You know, um, I just uh, our folks are so busy, um, and I, I like to do things in the moment. And so uh, when I put up an Instagram post or or a, uh, a tweet or something on Facebook, I tr I usually do it just right there. I just I just throw it out there, um, and. But occasionally, I've got uh, really good people in the university relations office that look at my calendar and they'll say, hey, Keith, you're going to be down in Ripley. You know, that would be a real good time. You're going to be down there on Friday afternoon. See if you can get something out by five down there. And so they're great about sort of helping me spot opportunities um, and, and, and do, doing that. Uh, they also, I've gotten to where I, if I'll build a uh, tweet or an Instagram post, I'll screenshot it and I'll send it to them and they'll say, no way, do not do that. Do <laughs> not hit send, delete, delete, delete. Uh, or, you know what, go ahead, go ahead and do that. Um, so, uh, I, but I, I enjoy that and I, I enjoy your account because I, I think you are, are very similar in that you just sort of have this organic spontaneous uh, piece, that, that piece about you that, that, you know what, I'm on my bike, that's a cool sunset, I'm talking about it. And um, 
you know, that's, and those are the type of accounts I'm interested in. The, the ones that are constantly saying, well, our institution is, top five, <laughs> right. and, you know, I mean, man, that's a yawner, you know? Yeah. And that's so, what most of them, you know, most college chancellors, you know, have boards and have uh, staff and everybody's jumpy about what, what's going to be posted and how things are going to be taken. And I'll be honest, there's a few times when I have started a post, you know, and then it went, and eh, delete, delete, delete. <laughs> so, no, it's not exactly what I want to say. So um, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's a, both a blessing and a curse. Yes. Uh, so, yes. Uh, but I, I too, am like you, I really enjoy it. Um, especially now that we're all hunkered down in various homes and offices and um, what, what are you, what are you doing at UT Martin now? I know some of your courses, you know, my wife teaches art history and so I know her classes have gone online and, and are finishing up, you know, what, what are you, how are you using social media and online to, to help the students? So, so every day uh, I try to do two things for students um, uh, one, one, one piece for our faculty and staff and one piece for our alumni. So four times a day, I try to provide some sort of content for our faculty and staff. It might be an email and, and we're just reinforcing what does safer at home mean for us. And so really trying to communicate internally, you know, about, our budget system, about what we're looking at for the summer, we're looking at the fall and, and getting that out there, uh, for students, it's, it's all, I don't email our students. I, I'll, I'll push occasionally a message on Instagram, Snapchat, uh, Facebook. And, and when you look at those uh, and, and the people down in university relations much smarter than I am, but they can read sort of who's getting those and, and Instagram and the, those methods, uh, I can get words out to students. And I'll, I'll try to do something encouraging. Uh, I'll try to do something uh, spontaneous. And therefore, alumni, uh, what my goal is with our alumni is, what can they be proud of about UT Martin this week? You know, um, so, uh, you know, yeah, our, our nursing program just got awarded uh, the best best uh, nursing program in the state, all right, by this outside. So, yeah, you, we have a press release, and that's good. But, you know, let me take a picture of a current student, a faculty member, and let me fire that out and say, who this is and why I'm taking their picture and, and doggone it, why this is so good and what, what's good about this program. So just trying to, to, to make stuff real and believable. Uh, I use a lot of uh, self-deprecating humor. Uh, I, you know, I have not got this figured out. This is the first chance or job I've ever had. Uh, and I mess up daily. Uh, you know, I left the, left the roof off my Jeep one day last spring and, and, and we got about three inches of rain and, uh, you know, I took a picture of me opening my Jeep door and water just pouring out of it because I forgot to put the roof on. Well, that was one of the most engagements I had all year. And I realized, you know, people, people want to see you mess up and they want to see that you're real and, and you're not on this pedestal. And uh, so I do a lot of fun things. Um, and then with students, you know, um, they just, uh, the biggest thing is being there. I mean, we get all these mounds and mounds of stats of, of best practices in higher ed and, and, and have small classes and, and um, you know, use technology and all that. But, and that's all very important, and I really pay attention to that. But I also try to go to where the students are. So on my way home, stop by a residence hall and sit in the lobby and talk to them for 15 minutes. You know, go drop in the library at night. You know, go eat lunch in the cafeteria. Go down to to higher ground and, and sit at an open table when you've got 30 minutes and see who comes in and just talk. And I think the, the personal side of that is, is, is as important as all this, these sheets of, of, of data that I get. And so I use all that and try to tell all those stories with, with social media. So uh, I need to go to a class. I need, I need to find some class like social media strategy for, you know, chancellors or something, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I need some education in that. Teach a class on no. social media. No. Oh gosh, no. Gosh, no. So what you're doing is working. Um, I know, uh, the number of students is up and, and, uh, everything, the future is bright. Um, question for those parents who have little first graders and second graders and yeah. they're just now starting out. 
Um, what is your advice to people with little bitty kids about how they should uh, interject about education in general? You know, I think the biggest thing is, is, is really stressing to those, to those little guys is, is find something you're passionate about and, and just do it. You know, um, do you like, do you like Legos and Lincoln logs and, 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 or, or, um, uh, you know, things where you're building, you know, you know, go and try a robotics camp and see, does that, does that spur an interest or, you know, are you a, are you a reader and you just can't put a book down or you've constantly got something on your iPad or so, you know, get them involved in some, some of the young reading and writing things. And I, I just see all these camps that are offered, um, you know, around the region and just take advantage of that. But, but really just trying to find out what they're passionate about and when whatever it is, and then just feed it, you know, and, and um, my, my little guy, well, he's not, little he's he's 14 he's an eighth grader but he's he's 6'2 and 250 pounds i i'm not sure where this kid came from i we we may have gotten the wrong baby from ut hospital but uh but he's he's ours now we're, we're having to feed him but you know he he is always been real invested in money and how money works and, and how money operates and not not so much spending money but uh so you know we're we're helping him understand he's got a little little count and and so uh, you know he's buying you know buying stock and and we're helping him with that and um you know i think he'll be our child that goes and probably goes into investments or accounting or banking and and we're just sort of feeding that so you know find something they love and and then just go all in and explore it uh, none of my three want to be in higher education. So I'm real sad about that, but, uh, they have no interest at all. But you never know. You never know. You never know. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much for spending a little bit of quarantine time with us today. Well, it's just a pleasure. And I tell you what, I can't wait for this thing to be, uh, I want us all to be safe, but I'm ready to get this thing back wide open again and be able to come to, uh, DPA and, and, really enjoy uh hopefully this summer maybe the end of the summer we can kind of do some fun things outside but um I, we're really looking forward to it and uh thank you so much for hiring our students as interns and uh letting our faculty work and play with you and uh we're just grateful we're very grateful for the partnerships and and back at you i cannot imagine a discovery park of america without a ut martin it's been a great partnership and we look forward to Many, many, many more years of working together. Absolutely. So are you in, in at night, are you helping work with that interstate coming through? I mean, are you out driving trucks? and? Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, there's about 600 feet that I'm in charge of. I love it. Yeah. I, man, I love it. I love it. I'll, you, I'll, need uh, to, you need to hop on one of those, uh, one of those ground movers and, and do yeah. some selfies, you know? Yeah, you know what? I actually ride my bike right, right past where they're working. Um, that is great. I, I have a feeling your your social media folks would are, are going to hear this and they're going to say, "No, Scott, please, please don't do that." No, no, no. I'm doing it. I'm doing. It. I'm going to tag you. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Hey, man, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be on, and um, really just appreciate your friendship. Absolutely. See you later. All right. Take care, guys. This is Scott Williams, president of Discovery Park of America. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.